Hi, I'm Jonathan Jay, and on this video, we're going to look at behind the scenes of buying a business. What happens in the mind of the seller when you have that initial phone call with them? And how can we make that phone call as effective as possible? If you're curious about buying a business, if you are wondering whether it's something that you could do, then I've put together a brand new training that's going to be absolutely perfect for you. There is a link in the video description below. Click the link, watch the training, and find out whether buying a business is something that you could do. And if you like this type of video, remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and tap the notifications bell, and you will receive a notification every time I release a new video on buying a business. So Andy, you are an expert on influence and an expert on selling. And so much of buying a business is selling the owner on why you should be the chosen buyer. Mm. So I'd like to explore with you what you feel are the best strategies for influencing someone, building rapport, and selling them on you, your personal credibility? Well, yes, and it's probably most of the opposite of what would probably, for most people, come naturally. Um, the big mistake everyone makes with selling is to open their mouth and speak too much. So selling really is asking. Selling isn't telling. Selling is asking. The skill is to ask the right questions that get the other party speaking to you in such a way that, number one, they reveal the truth. Because all of us, when we have conversations, let alone a negotiation situation, aren't always going to reveal the truth. And what you've got to get to, really, is... Why is this transaction happening? What's the real pain that's driving? Because in essence, every action we take is driven by the need to avoid pain and therefore to experience gain. And that's different for everyone. And so this person's coming to this transaction because they have a problem to be solved. But two things. Number one, we don't know what their problem is yet. And number two, they might not either. And what I mean by that is, they might have some idea what the problem is, but they haven't really fully explored, investigated, probably spoken to anybody about it. In, that, in essence, you would be better off coming into it from a place of not needing the sale, but actually coming to a place where you're genuinely interested in this scenario and situation, in that you really want to discover what the real challenges and problems are. Not because you necessarily want to make the deal or understand the problems this business has, of course, that's important. But so you first come from a place of empathy and understanding. Yes. Because that builds trust. You become friendly from that perspective. All salespeople really are therapists. <laughs> that's an interesting if way they of putting it. They can become more like a therapist. Yes. Uh, which means that they genuinely care, but they ask the right questions at the right time and also the skill is then understanding, okay, what question shall you ask next based on what they told me that gets to an even deeper level of truth? Because we all speak at a surface level in the beginning. I'm not particularly good at small talk myself, but it doesn't make me very socially um, adequate because I like getting to deep stuff quite quickly, which is not what you do or it's not easy to do at a party when you can't really hear very well. But in a setting where you are needing to go deep, then the skill is understanding what questions to ask that gets the person to reveal themselves. But not so they reveal themselves to you, but also so they reveal themselves to themselves. Okay. Because only when they understand what the problem is, and only when they can really feel that problem, because understanding it and knowing it and feeling it are two different things, because mm. you're also trying to activate that problem in the person's, uh, to use a a more technical phrase, inside their neurology, so that that problem becomes activated, they then become a bit more motivated to do something about it. Okay, so let, let's um, let's see how this works in this very specific context of buying a business. Now, the seller has a motivation for wanting 
to sell. And everyone always assumes that the motivation is money. They want to make as much money as possible. And you know, it's because we've watched too much Dragon's Den and Shark Tank and we think that everyone's all about the money. And the genuine motivation typically is is not that. It's it's retirement and it's spending more time with the family. It's getting rid of the stress. And quite often there's some ill health in there as well, especially for the people retiring. So there's all these other reasons why people want to sell their business. And if we can understand that motivation for why they want to sell, and I think you're saying that helping them understand it for themselves as well, then we can tailor make our proposition to that motivation. Is is that what we're saying here? Exactly right. Yeah. And when you said you can tailor make your proposition exactly, but even then the skill becomes, how do I get them? How do I ask questions in such a way that they almost make the proposition to me? Okay. But it's actually my proposition. Ah, now that's very interesting. So if you can actually make that in essence any time whenever you're communicating with somebody there's only two as we are now there's only two things happening one person's asked questions the other party makes statements those statements are either statements of fact or statements of belief and the mistake most sales people will make is that when they're doing their proposal or their presentation or going through you know how things are going to work is that they then go on a big, long tirade of how it's all going to work. And number one, most of the time, people can't take all that in, especially if it's something they're not familiar with, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the goal really isn't to say too much, especially in one long sentence, but actually to try to turn that around is how can I ask a question so that what comes out of the other person's mouth is what could have come out of mine, but okay. I no longer have to say it because they've said it instead. Okay. That's a real art because then what I, in a selling concept, context, whatever I say, if I'm the salesperson, whatever I say, say they're going to distrust, um, they're not necessarily going, they're going to own. So there's, a, there's some suspicion there, isn't there? There's right. some cynicism yeah. about what are your motivations. Right. Because it's that selling context, so there's going to, they're going to have salesitis. You know, it's like tonsillitis, isn't it? So, you know, going to have some kind of defense. But everything that comes out of their mouth, they hear, number one, because it came out of their mouth, mm -hmm. and they own. So that's the skill is how do you present it in such a way that – you don't feel they don't feel sold to they don't even feel like it's a sales situation and most people once they've made a declaration of something or suggested an idea about something themselves it's quite hard to back out of that because mm -hmm. it becomes a yes set it becomes a um uh in essence a yes set where you start to look for more ways to back up the original idea. So mm -hmm. ideas that follow that one that's already been said tend to follow suit. Rather than the other way around when you you suggest something as a salesperson, they have some kind of hesitation in their voice about it and they now start looking for evidence and reasons why that isn't a good idea because it's your idea, not their idea. <laughs> Interesting. So so in a in a business buying process, we're going to spend about 30 minutes with the owner on the phone in what we call a discovery call, where we're trying to understand their motivations for selling the business. Uh, and we're trying to understand a bit about the business. And quite often, those owners can be defensive. They don't want to reveal their, their revenue. They don't want to reveal their profit so early on. Now, some are very open, but many are a little bit cagey. So how do we break down those, those barriers? Well, just don't start with those questions. <laughs> You know, unless there's a good reason to do so, you probably want to start more with their passion. Okay. You want to start with their story. Right. You know, that's a great place to start. It's like, okay, so tell me about this business. What, what got you so interested in creating this business in the first place? You yes. could have, I'm sure someone like you could have done a multitude of things. Why did you decide to do this? What was it about this that made you feel like this was something you wanted to spend the last 10, 15, 20 years of your life doing? If you can rewind back, tell me, because I'm, I'm somebody who might be wanting to do that myself now. And I'm quite interested to hear your story. And you learn so much from that. From and, that and, and what does that question, uh, how does that question make the owner feel? 
I'm interrupting your video with a very important message. If you are watching a video like this, it's probably because you're serious about buying a business. But watching free videos on YouTube will only take you so far. You need to take the next step. And the next step is a link that's somewhere on the screen up at the top, uh, which takes you through to our free video training. There's no cost whatsoever. You watch the free video training and that will give you some of the essential basics that you need. Now, if you get value from that, then I would invite you to be part of my next Fast Track program. Now, the Fast Track program has been running for a couple of years now. We've had nearly 3,000 people around the world on the Fast Track program, and it's a Zoom program that you can attend from anywhere. Uh, it's broadcast from my living room to your living room, where I will teach you what you need to know to go and buy your first business. And there's a Q&A section at the end of each of the training sessions, so you can ask me all of your questions. Now, if you get great value from that and you're really serious about buying a business, then there's my mastermind program, a 12 month program where we hold your hand through the business buying process so that you can buy your first company. And when you have, I'll invite you into our inner circle, which is exclusively for people who've bought their first business. So that's what we've got lined up for you. It's up to you whether you take the next step. Anyway, Back to the video. Whenever, forget a situation again, that's a sales situation. Let's say you and I, the more you get to know someone, the more of your backstory you will ultimately reveal. That's just the way it works. And that's almost a reciprocation as well, because then when somebody reveals themselves to you, then you would tend to respond in a similar fashion. So by by being generally interested in the other person's story, you are, and if they start to reveal themselves to you, they have to trust you to do that. that I mean, to tell you the yes. story, they have to trust you because you're, they're revealing history. Yes. Right? And I, I know that all of that, not all of that history is great. And so by, by gently starting slipping into their story, then they will, they have to trust you to do it. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, I mean, obviously they can still remain guarded, for example, but you can listen to those cues as well. And again, that comes into the questions that you might want to ask a bit later. You can come back to, oh, you said earlier something about blah, blah, blah. Can you tell me a bit more about that, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. part of the, the journey sort of three or four years ago? You're listening out for those cues as well. But it just, it, it means they'll open up to you because it becomes like a conversation. It's not an interrogation anymore. It's not mm -hmm. the Spanish mm -hmm. Inquisition. It's a, it's an open conversation because you have to, you have to have that in order for the more difficult questions to be answered. Yeah. So, so if you've got that rapport because they've opened up about their history and their story, then the harder edged questions around profitability, for example, mm. become easier to answer because there's already that trust there. Yeah, exactly. It's a, they've already started to reveal themselves somewhat to you. And again, it's it depend you, you as you then ask them to go through that story, then some of those questions that can relate to that part. You know, things like, okay, so what did you find what was the most challenging thing that happened in the beginning of the business? What was mm -hmm. what was challenging about that? So you start you start asking pain related questions but they are they're firstly historically pain related questions you know what you know what was the challenge when you first got started that's a much easier question to someone answer because that's not on problem anymore because it's 10 years ago mm -hmm. and when you then follow actually so and what's you know what's challenging right now what's yes. the most see now you've slipped very nicely into the now which is much more painful but they've already opened up to what happened a year uh, you know in the first yeah, year so yeah. now what's happening 10 years later it's kind of hard to back out of that question yes and they've also began to you know they're, they're opening up it's that that neural uh, pathway uh, is there and and i suppose that <clears throat> if there, there's got to be a motivation for someone to call um because we we use direct mail to to find potential sellers of yeah. businesses and if someone phones up as a result of receiving that letter, there's got to be a, a reason why they have called. And if we can get them to reveal the pain in their business, and it is going to be either pain in their business or pain in their personal life that is causing them to want to sell the business, then 
understanding that pain is going to help us craft a deal, an offer for them that satisfies the pain. And the pain might be, I just find it also stressful. You know, the, I don't like the staff. The staff don't like me. <laughs> I don't like going into the office anymore. I just want to hand someone the keys. And understanding that surely has to be beneficial in our negotiation over a price. Yeah, of course. And not just that, but also about urgency as well, you know, and because if they often want to think about it, delay it, for example. But if you know what that pain is, then you can ask another question, you know, which is, yes. you know, let's say they you know, admit they're really in pain. You say, yeah, of course, if you want to think about it, that's natural. Um I guess I guess what I'm thinking though is what would you gain by waiting? You know, based on what you've been saying to me about the pain you're in. What what's what what do you think you'll gain by by holding off for another couple of weeks when you you know, you said to me this, this and this? Wouldn't it be easier and quicker? Since you're gonna to have to make that decision at some point anyway, wouldn't it be good to get rid of the pain now rather than wait? Yes, because you know, it's, it, you know yeah. but you know what the pain is. But if you don't know what it is, you've got nothing to deal with. So, so some sometimes um, uh, pe people on my program will come back to me and they'll say, uh, "I was talking to an owner, and uh, by the end of the call, he wasn't really sure whether he wanted to sell anymore." Mm. So, what do you think happened in that sort of situation? They phoned because they wanted to sell, but thirty minutes later, ah. Maybe they don't want to sell. No, they just don't want to sell to them. <laughs> that's just a that's just a smokescreen, isn't it? I mean, if you go through the, the, the all of those efforts, it just means that it's that's just you know it's one of those classic. You you get objections which are you know not the real objection. That's most of the time that's the case. Yes. Um, and I'm yeah you know, I'm not just I'm not quite sure if I want to sell or, not, or sell right now. For example, they might say. Is really just a smoke screen for you screwed it up and they don't like you very much. They didn't like the deal very much. You made it feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Something of that nature is way more likely because how many times do you then find that business sold a week later? Somebody else. Somebody else, yes. So, so do you find then that people are very slow to admit that they may be the problem in that type of situation? You know, you're buying a business or you're selling a product. They want to blame it on... Yeah, we couldn't get a deal. The price was too high. You know, all, all of those things. They blame it on external factors. They very rarely say, "Well, maybe I just didn't do a very good job on the call." Yeah, look, that's not something reserved only for the buying and selling of businesses. Human beings in in general don't want to take responsibility. It's much easier to fix the blame outside of yourself because that's obviously more comfortable in my game of public speaking and presenting, which is more the era of the uh, I champion in, I say there are no good audiences, but there are also no bad audiences. They're just inflexible presenters. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, oh, the audience didn't get it. That's why I uh, didn't do so well today. You know, it wasn't my kind of audience. Um, I'll give you a little analogy of this. That um, Years ago, there was a, a diver, his name was Greg Luganis. American diver, always used to win the Olympics and the world championships. And one particular Olympics, he was being beaten by into fourth position with about two or three dives to go by the Chinese. And they had uh, been studying Greg Luganis's dives. And they'd studied all of his best dives, all of his like 10 out of 10 dives, for example. Um but in the end, Lugana still won that particular championship. And the interviewer often said, no, how, you know, how come? You know, how come you always win? He said, well, look, he said, diving is about hitting the sweet spot. When you hit the sweet spot on the board, you always know immediately, if you're a good diver, this is going to be a great dive. He said, but the problem is the sweet spot is about the size of a penny. It's really small and really difficult to hit it exactly on. So what makes a world championship diver is somebody who misses the sweet spot but still knows how to turn it into a 10 out of 10. And that the Chinese couldn't do because they'd only studied these 10 out of 10 dives when he didn't have to make any adaptions. Ah, I see. But that's the point about business, communication, anything in general. It's your ability to adapt and be flexible in any situation since nothing follows a script. You know, you could have a sales script, right? But the only problem is the customer doesn't follow the script, only you can. <laughs> the other <laughs> side doesn't really care about your script. So you can have a framework for it, 
uh, phases, if you will. But all those phases really should be is what kind of questions do I ask in the first five minutes? What kind of questions should I ask in the next, you know, you know, in the next five minutes? But even then, you still got to have the ability to when they say something, what type of question do I ask next that funnels me down? And the most common thing you would see um, business or relatively new people are buy, wanting to buy business is not asking open questions. Yes. And asking too many closed questions. Closed questions are terrible because you have to ask another one immediately afterwards. So, and they don't inspire the other person to open up and to you know, share, for example. Mm-hmm. And they also sometimes back people into a corner with yes or no answers. Or, you know, they kind of back people into a corner, which doesn't allow them to feel like they have control of the conversation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. There we go. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I wanted to introduce you to a great lawyer in the UK who can get your deals done for you. He's worked for 50 of my mastermind clients in the last few months alone. His name is John Andrews, and I've got his details right here in my little back book of contacts. You can phone him on 0345 241 2494, or you can email him on johnandrews.deallawyer at jmw.co.uk. If you want someone who can get a deal done, he is your guy. So let's get back to the video. Let's say we've got someone who uh, is uh, is following a framework of questions, not a script, but a framework of questions, talking to the owner for the first time. They've, they've started with this uh, open question, tell me about your business. You know, how did you get into this? What was it that, that drew you to the sector in the first place? And we've built that rapport. And then we're moving on to those harder edge questions around, you know, give me some facts and figures. And what happens then if we start to feel the owner pull back a little bit? We get this sense that you know, they started very chatty and, and now they're starting to sound a little bit reticent. But we need that information in order to evaluate whether this is a, a business we're interested in or not. Any techniques for dealing with that reticence? Yeah, you've got you to you label it. You've got to call it out, basically. Don't let it, you know, just be honest with that person and that point and say, uh, do you mind me asking you something? When we spoke earlier, you know, you seemed quite open and, you know, things were flowing quite nicely. But now we got down to talking about the figures. I get this sense that some of these things, some of these numbers aren't so easy to say. All right, yeah. Um, and I get that. Because, you know, you're in a position where, you know, you want to sell the business and, you know, maybe numbers aren't always been your thing. I don't know. But um, the reason I I really want to know this is so I constructed a deal that it's the best win-win for both of us. The last thing I want is to to begin to structure a deal that doesn't work for you. And then ultimately, you and I haven't got the, the deal that both of us might want from this. So what's going on? Talk to me. I love that. I think that's great. So, so that that is so good, and I think that would be a, such an excellent couple of sentences to introduce into just about any conversation with an owner when it feels like there's a there's a slight tension yeah. developing. Yeah, it's, it's, the question is like, but what's going on? Talk to me. What's on your mind? Yeah, I, I really want to help. So. To reframe it, you're framing yeah, it as I, I'm here I to like help that. you. If you're like, I, I really, really want to help. So what's going on? What's on your mind? What's what's up? So now we've got to the point then where we've we've got some numbers, and I suppose in 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 sales talk, we're 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 there to close the deal. Now the deal we're trying to close on that on that discovery call is a face to face meeting. Sure. And we've got now that challenge of booking the meeting which we want to book in as soon as possible because if we leave it for a couple of weeks they're going to go cool on the idea maybe even speak to another potential buyer so we need to book it in quickly any techniques for moving us from i think this sounds like an interesting business to i want you to get in your car and drive 100 miles to meet me Mm -hmm. how do we do that well, again, probably the same thing I started with in the first place is turn it around the other way. Don't make the suggestion yourself. Okay. You know, it's an, it's, a, it's another suggestion. It's almost like you've got to be the opposite of interested, almost. Not to the point that they you 
become so disinterested that they don't like you as such. It mm-hmm, feels mm-hmm. You know, inappropriate. But it's like I, I am. You, you say something. Well, I'm really interested in this, and I'd love to be in a position where we could get together and talk about it. But I do know my schedule probably doesn't allow that at the moment. If there was, if there was a space in it, what do you feel? You know, if, if we, if I, if I was going to find us, if I was going to move things around and 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 try to find some space to have a conversation about, what, what, what would you? What, why would I yeah. do that? What do you think? Okay, so, so it's like my place of authority, like my diary's, you know, open. I'm desperate. You don't well, want to that, come that, that's around. the thing. Yeah, I, I can get in my car and drive five hundred miles to see you uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah, it it doesn't it doesn't position you well, no. does it? And that's all that's going to do is make the person retreat. Mm-hmm. You actually got to at this point we've got to make them move towards us. So it's like dating. Um, I've never done this, but I've studied it. <laughs> um, but if you are as a guy wanting to date, you know, it, or with a girl, you somebody you, you like, for example, in a bar, let's say, then what you would do is you would go and communicate something, you know, have this good conversation, for example. And then after about five or ten minutes, you'd say, look, I really, really, in-, you know, she's giving you all the signals. I really, really enjoyed uh, chatting to you, get to know you a bit. I, I need to go and see, uh, to spend some time with my friends now. Um, uh, thanks for thanks for the chat. Might see you a bit later. And literally move away from them because you've got to create the space for them or her to move back towards you. Yes. Um, which means, you know, you need to, obviously you'd still have eye contact. You'd be in a position where you'd have enough eye contact over that area in the bar, for example, to see if she looks over. You'd smile, nod, for example, or wink at her or whatever, right? But you've got to create the space to allow her to feel that she's in control. You sound like an expert at this, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I do study human behaviour quite a lot, but... There we are. That's fantastic. So, so you've got to create that space. You've got to create the space for them to move towards you. Again, anything they would own is more likely to happen. Yes, and, and then we can get our successful meeting. So I think I think what you've you've really helped our listeners and our viewers with is getting getting that discover putting that discovery call that thirty minute discovery call into the context of uh, not being needy letting the other person the seller open up uh, but leading the conversation guiding it because if you don't guide it it's it's not going to have a shape is it yeah you it's all guided around the the quality and type of questions that you ask and then how you then ask further deeper questions there afterwards but the the context of the call should be framed in one which is not a sale Yes. Do not frame this conversation as a sales conversation. You will not get the right data. The person will be defensive on the other side because so many of these discovery call processes start off with the completely wrong frame. And the frame is, oh, we're here to discuss how you can, you know, you know, you've signed up for this, you've asked for this. So at the end of this call, I'll be asking you some questions to see if you're, see if, it, see if you working with us is the right thing and da-da-da. You, no, don't do that. You've completely framed the conversation one of, you know, we're here, I'm here to sell to you and you're going to be sold to and you're going to be opened up. And if you waste my time, then sure, no, no, you do the opposite of that. Completely take away the sales element because any time you can be selling when the other person doesn't feel like you're selling, you're going to be winning most of the time. I mean, the danger is of doing this approach is that, which, which is why a lot of these folks go down this framing of it's a sales call is because you don't want to waste time. Because mm-hmm. you could end up opening up a conversation with somebody that isn't, you know, isn't one you want to get into, and there there is no desire or there is no, um, uh, you know, no no urgency on their part to do a deal, or whatever. But you're only going to find that out by asking questions anyway. And there's only so much you can do with some kind of questionnaire at the beginning mm-hmm. to, um, you know, to filter the call. There's only so much of that. You're still going to have to spend some time with some people that you know you can't that's help just, that's aren't. just the way it is that's the numbers game that's just the yeah. way that those you know and then that's fine but again that's why it's important to have good question at the beginning really listen out and get that you know that sort of sixth sense of understanding if this sounds like it's the right kind of thing you know but if you're leading all the time and you're you know making too many statements yourself if you're talking about yourself not, not, not the right thing to be doing. So, you specialise in public speaker 
speaker training. Mm. How do people find out more about what you do? How do people get in touch with you? Sure, yeah. Um, if they're interested in presenting, because we, we te- I don't teach presenting for the sake of presenting. My stuff is presenting for profit. So how do you, in your context, it would be some, some people doing a presentation to business owners who are particularly maybe interested in uh, selling their business. And they would listen, for example, to some kind of virtual presentation. Maybe it goes for 60, 90 minutes for a sub, for example. At the end of they put their phone number in because they might be interested, for example. So it's about generating mm-hmm. leads and sales, presenting for profit. So we run um, a virtual event a couple of times a week on a Wednesday and a Saturday. And if they're interested in registering for that, they can just go to www.presentation-profits.com. Lovely. Andy Harrington, thank you very much.